comes over to uh, to Christian. Oh, there we go. Howdy, everybody. Um, I'm going to start my video here real quick, just for just briefly. It's very bright. <laughs> um, wow, can't get the light right in here. Um, welcome everyone to the third night, um, although really the second because we unfortunately missed Chris Hobbs last night. Chris Hobbs is okay, um, and they'll be rescheduling Chris for a future talk. Um, but tonight we've got Luca Hickey, um, and I'm really excited. I have known of Luca, even though I've never met Luca, um, because I've encountered Luca's observations on iNaturalist, as well as seeing Luca's posts. Yeah, there you go, the t-shirt. Um, as well as seeing Luca's posts on Instagram. And I know a lot of us are from a, a different generation or a former generation that isn't familiar with what's happening there. I am on Instagram and it sounds like it's just social media as trivial as any other social media website. But what Luca and others are doing there is something um, that I think is actually really important to the future of mycology, to the future of science, which is to bring um, little snippets of uh, sort of what we talk about in the academic world or in um, behind journal paywalls and illustrate it beautifully and communicate it in digestible little snapshots for a broader audience and make it very palatable. Um, so people like Lauren Ray, who we saw on screen just a few minutes ago and Luca's friend Jack and Connor Dooley from up north, I think of them as this cadre of up and coming young uh, community scientists and science educators and interpreters who's apparently and very happily for us, favorite group of organisms seems to be mushrooms. So we're all going to learn a lot from Luca and Luca's friends in the coming decades. Um, and tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce you all to Luca, who's going to be talking about um, the similarities and the differences between our near and dearly beloved coast redwood tree down here and the red cedars, a very closely related but significantly different tree that you find starting in Humboldt County and it becomes even much more common in the Pacific Northwest where Luca normally is, although tonight Luca is broadcasting from Trinidad in the Caribbean. So this is all very special. Um, give a warm welcome to Luca, everybody. Hi, Luca. Hi, everyone. Um, here, let me get my screen sharing now. Uh, okay. Okay, now I remember how this works. Cool. Um, wait, now I'm forgetting how this works. Okay, here we go. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Luca Higgy, like um, Christian just said. Um, I am a mycologist, of course, but my story with fungi goes back quite a long ways. I grew up in Sonoma County, um, and as a kid, as a little baby and a toddler, really, my dad would take me on his foraging trips out into the woods. Um, in a little baby backpack and he would set me down and poke around me in a circle if he saw a promising patch of duff. So I like to think that's really how my brain got started with the fungi. But I didn't really get too interested in learning about them myself until I went to college. And so I attended the Evergreen State University in Olympia, Washington. And I joined the mycology club there that my friend Lauren Ray started. And ever since then, you know, we started doing our weekly forays out into the woods. They have a really beautiful thousand acre woods or something like that around the campus. And there's just trails everywhere. And I know it like the back of my hand now. The year when I was living there, I would go out into the woods every single day. Um, I usually was looking for mushrooms. I got a copy of Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast and tried my best to memorize it front to back, like you all should. Um, and from there, I've just really snowballed, got myself on iNaturalist, got myself into uh, sending my finds off to do DNA work. And now I've got a microscope and the whole shebang. So it really sucked me in. <laughs> but I'm interested in plants and lichens as well as the mushroom forming fungi that we'll be talking about mostly tonight. Um, yeah, so this talk is about 
the redwood forests and the red cedar forests, cedars, um, that we find up in the Northwest. Um, and I'll be touching a little bit on some other related plants and how they have the potential for these interesting fungal communities as well. Um, so yeah, the family of trees that I'm talking about today is the Cupressaceae, the Cypress family. There are a lot of plants in this genus, everything from junipers to cedars, false cedars, we call them cedars here on the west coast, um, to the redwoods and the giant sequoia, the bald cypress. But um, the two trees that we're going to be focusing on mainly tonight are the coast redwood, sequoia sempervirens, and the, um, the western red cedar, Thuja plicata. And these are really our main area of interest just because they grow where there's a lot of water. And so we see fungi under these trees year round just because they're in moisture loving habitats. Um, these trees also have a lot of antifungal compounds in their wood and in their foliage. So this presents a challenge to the fungi that are generally adapted to eating, you know, just any kind of wood, whether it be hardwood or conifer. And so you get a lot of specialized things that are happening in this type of forest. Um, first of all, here is Sequoia sempervirens. Um, you should all be familiar with this tree living in Santa Cruz. Uh, they, of course, they've got this beautiful red bark that they're super well known for. It's really thick, sort of like a shaggy insulation like your asbestos. Um, and they have these really iconic straight out branches kind of curving up at the top. They also have needles that are splayed out flat and about the same length as their neighbors with the exception of the ends of each spray. So that's pretty easy to identify as far as tree ID goes. Um, they occur, as you know, right along the California coast, up north into Oregon, just a few groves in Oregon. So they really stay mostly in California and they're heavily dependent on the fog from the sea coming in from the Pacific. In the summertime, most of their water actually comes from the fog. So as the fog rolls in um, on a really hot day, you can go out onto the tops of those ridges and you can watch the fog drip start to happen as the fog collects on the needles on the tops of the redwoods and drips down into the understory. They can actually soak up a good amount of water straight through those needles without having it having to get it from their roots. But if you've ever been in a redwood grove on a strong fog drip day, it is as if it was a heavy rain. Um, I've been out sometimes and especially in the old growth on the, the ridge tops by the sea, like I said, um, you can go up on a dry as bone, sunny 95 degree day. And by the time the fog hits, it's raining as hard as you'd ever imagine inside that grove and only inside the redwood grove as well as being adapted to this fog environment. Um, these are fire adapted plants uh, being a part of the California floristic province. The whole ecosystem is pretty fire dependent. They have several ways that they can cope with a wildfire happening. Up here in the top middle, you can see three that are re-sprouting about two years after a really hot fire burned through this area. These three were lucky to not get salvage logged or anything like that because two, two years prior, they basically just looked like little dead sticks, all blackened and burned. But at this point, they are sending out foliage, not just on those branches, but also all along the trunk. So they look like a weird fuzzy green telephone pole if it was wearing a sweater or something like that. They can also completely hollow out inside when they burn, which is one of my favorite things about the redwoods. It's absolutely iconic. The heartwood of the trees, of course, it's not alive. It's just a structural component. So they can lose that safely um, and still stay alive. That thick bark protects the living layer inside. Um, and so that hollowed out tree will still be standing. This one in the bottom is a really old one. 
that you could fit like three or four people in there easy. Sometimes they hollow out all the way to the top and you can go inside and look in and peer out and see the sky. And that's just absolutely, absolutely magical to see in a living tree. I've, uh, I don't know, there's nothing quite like it. <laughs> um, so through Hippocata, as you can see, the range map is a lot bigger on this tree, the Western red cedar. It's more of a generalist than the redwood. It doesn't need that fog drip as much. It really just grows in the lowlands wherever there's enough rain. So if there's rain or if there's groundwater, it needs a lot of water though. It's a shade tolerant tree and it grows very slowly. So it occupies what we would call a late successional stage in the Northwest forest. The way the tree succession works in this Western Cascade ecosystem that I live in most of the year, um, if there's a disturbance like a mudslide or a clear cut or what have you, the first trees to come up are always the alders. They're a very fast growing for a tree and they're very short lived. They also have nitrogen fixing bacteria in their roots that help them enrich the soil as they grow. But they're very short lived for a tree, only 150 years max or so, even though that's a lot by our standards. Um, and under these deciduous trees, more, more shade tolerant conifers, but faster growing ones like the dug fir will often start to take over. And as those alders start to fall down, then you get a canopy that's dominated by the Douglas fir. And that's a much darker forest, of course, because Doug fir don't lose their needles at any point of the year. Whereas these trees are more of a third or a fourth successional stage tree in a healthy forest because they're so slow growing and so shade tolerant that they can tolerate that first layer of conifer tree over them. They grow really slowly and they wait for that opening in the canopy in order to shoot up and become their full height. They have a few adaptations for unstable soil. They have a really wide spreading root system similar to the redwoods. Um, sometimes you'll see in cedar groves, you can see down below the roots, there will be little holes and you can watch water just flowing like a foot or so below the ground. There'll be like a little underwater water flow and the cedar just holds the ground together above that. They also have these big thick buttresses on their bases. So that's kind of like a tropical rainforest tree. If you've seen any pictures of like the ficus and things that live in the tropics. These are basically just another stabilization mechanism. They're spreading themselves out and anchoring themselves into the soil really well. The needles on the red cedar look quite different from the redwood, even though they're very closely related. They have very small needles that are overlapped. Um, they almost look like a little braid. And that's actually where it gets the specific epithet plicata. That means pleated or braided in Latin. And the branches, the branch structure is also very, very different. Instead of having those straight out branches that are, I guess, adapted to catching fog. I don't know if that's specifically what they're for, but it seems to be one of the effects of having those straight branches. The red cedar has very curly branches. They form a J shape often. Sometimes they'll spiral around the tree in some ways. And especially the dead ones in the lower story will be very, very curly and wavy and weird looking. These trees also shed water really efficiently. So if, you, if you're out in a rainstorm, like most days are in the Northwest, if you stand below one of these cedar trees right at the base, you might not get any rain at all. And when the first rains hit, um, you can see the rest of the ground in the forest gets wet before the ground right around the tree. So instead of trying to catch all that water, it's more trying to shed it off because they're less water limited in their habitat than the redwoods. Well, and I also have to say that um, the name red cedar is very misleading. True cedars uh, belong to the genus Cedrus, which is only found in Eurasia, um, mostly around the Mediterranean, but there are some cedars that grow in the Himalayan mountains as well. 
we should really be calling these red western red cypress because they are part of the cypress family and not even closely related to cedars at all um, the genus Thuja is found in some parts of East Asia, but it's also mostly restricted to North America. Here's two examples of redwood forest on the left and cedar forest on the right. You can see how similar the understories look and the forest in general. They've both got that red bark, although I think that's more of a coincidence than anything else. But you can see that the understories are really dominated by sword fern. And on the on the right, or sorry, on the left, um, that one is very clearly really open. It has a lot of thick duff layer. The one on the right is a little more misleading just because of the angle that I took this photo at. But behind those ferns, there's quite a few big clearings um, where it's mostly duff as well. That's because these forests are, of course, really shade limited. These, these trees form a really dark understory. And also they're limited by the soil conditions that is created by that thick layer of duff. Um, it can get really acidic, which a lot of plants can't tolerate. And it also just, yeah, it's a limiting factor for them. So you can see this, the same exact sword fern in both scenarios. A lot of the same plants um, will occupy these understories and they don't have very diverse plant communities in general, but the fungal communities are another story. Um, most people ignore redwood and cedar forests in terms of looking for edible mushrooms because they don't have mycorrhizal fungi or not ectomycorrhizal fungi associated with the trees, but there are some edibles that will come up really readily in these forests, Craterellus tubiformis, the yellowfoot being one of them. Um, these mushrooms are mycorrhizal, but mostly with huckleberries in the Northwest at least, which is a fairly common understory plant in especially mixed cedar or redwood forests but they really like a thick duff layer and especially a thick rotting wood layer. So you'll often see big clusters of these mushrooms coming up right through a rotted log or all around it, that sort of thing. Um, I'm not sure if they're actually digesting that wood and sending that to the host plant, but it would make logical sense that that's the case just because they really prefer this thick organic material of the forest. And these are more of a winter mushroom, um, especially in the Northwest. They'll really be fruiting all winter throughout the rains. I haven't found many of them in California, actually before this year, I found a lot this year. Seems to be a really good year in California. I don't know if anybody else had that experience, but my last few years have been very dry. So it was nice to see some good rains, at least while I was there. <sighs> Sorry, I'm a little tired, it's late here. Um, next we have Cantharellus roseocanus. So this is actually a summer mushroom. You might not think there's a lot of summer mushrooms in California, but that fog drip season that I mentioned earlier really peaks during the summer. And some mushrooms that want water, but also don't like it too cold will be fruiting mostly during the summer. And this mushroom is one of them, the rainbow chanterelle. Um, they are really delicious. They are out of sync with the other chanterelles. So if you're waiting to get your chanterelle fix and you don't want to wait till fall or winter, you could, uh, it's possible you could find them in July or August or September, uh, depending on how the fog is looking. And they also grow in the same areas in the Northwest. Also in the end of the summer, again, they can't tolerate the cold too much, but they do require a fair bit of rain or fog drip, as it were. And they're also, like, like the winter chanterelle, they're also ectomycorrhizal with plants in the blueberry family, like the salal and the evergreen huckleberry, what have you. Um, next, we have the Prince Agaric. Um, this is another end of the summer mushroom in the Northwest. I think it can go a little later in the fall into California because it's less limited by the cold, but it is a decay mushroom. 
it really likes redwood and cedar duff, especially in a, like a mixed open forest where it's got a lot of, yeah, a lot of thick duff layers to decompose. It's a bit of an oddity in terms of edible mushrooms. I don't know if y'all have ever tried it. I'm sure some of you have, but it has a really weird, sweet, cloying uh, marzipan type of smell when it's fresh. And then when it's cooked, it has it, it gets a really savory meat taste, but it also has that sweet taste at the same time. Um, I don't like it if it's heavily seasoned at all. I don't know. If, if you're new to trying this mushroom, I would recommend just cook it with a little salt and pepper because you really want to taste everything that's going on in this mushroom without anything to distract you from it. It's very, it's got a very complex flavor. And also learn all of your agaricus before you go eating these because there are quite a few scaly capped brown looking agaricus that look a lot like it, but they'll lack the marzipan smell as well and have different staining reactions and what have you. Lastly, in terms of edibles, this is another late summer mushroom. So that's kind of an interesting trend with, at least with edible mushrooms in this type of forest. This is a wood decay fungus that seems to have a really easy time breaking down wood that is hard to decompose. The whole genus Latoporus seems to be really good at it. They can even eat the eucalyptus trees that are so invasive in California, which is really mind blowing to me because those seem to have even more tannins and acid and different compounds in them than these redwoods do. But they're, they also grow on the redwoods and on the cedars as well as well as a lot of different conifers, the hemlocks and the, and the spruces, especially. Some people report getting sick specifically off of the conifer species. I never have. And I have read that later on, as more reports of sickenings have come in, that people are reporting um, the hardwood species is you know, just as bad. And also most of these sickenings come from people who eat them raw or who don't cook them properly, which I would never recommend eating mushroom that hasn't been cooked properly, but especially one of these polypores because they can be really tough. And if they are older, they get really woody. So stick to the tender ones as far as latoporus goes. So now we are on to the duff decomposers. Um, the duff habitat in these redwood forests is a lot less limited by that toxin, that, um, sorry, not toxin, the um, antifungal compounds that are present in the wood because that heartwood is so big. It takes a lot of time for water to soak all the way through it. It's hard for a fungus to penetrate through that uh, deoxygenated, maybe dehydrated environment. Whereas in the duff, you have little bits of decomposing matter that are much easier for a fungus to degrade. This one is quite common in cedar and redwood forests, but also in conifer forests of all types. It's kind of a generalist conifer needle decay fungus, Athenia adonis. They're very tiny, pink, beautiful little mushroom. Um, Next up is Rhodomyces roridus. This is another one that really enjoys that summer fog drip season a lot. They grow especially on huckleberry and redwood and tan oak debris, but really debris of all kinds. Another kind of a generalist leaf litter decay mushroom. They look a lot like any manner of hemimycena or atheniella or true mycena that you might see trooping around in the forest floor. But the real way to tell these apart is the thick glutinous layer that you can see on the stipes here. It's like, yeah, slimier than any mushroom you'll ever see. And the cap is almost completely dry. So it's a very unique feature to see in a mushroom. I don't know what that's for, or why, why they would have anything like that. It's very puzzling, very interesting every time I see it. Here is Mycena oregonensis. 
I call them the yellow troopers because they are often in troops of like hundreds, sometimes even thousands in the fall throughout the duff, um, just going wild. But they are really tiny, even tinier than the first two I showed you. I wish I had one with a ruler here. But sometimes the cap is just a few millimeters across. It may look like there's only a few fruit bodies in all of these photos, but really I just picked the nicest ones out of a big troop because they're almost always in huge, huge numbers. And here is the Mycena epiterogea group. I'm sure you're familiar with these. They're pretty stunning, um, if you like Mycenas at all. Um, these ones on the left were actually growing on a branch that was still attached to a living redwood tree. The branch itself was dead, but it was like five or six feet off the ground, so a little above eye level for me. There was just this little line of yellow-legged mushrooms trooping along there, which is really amazing to see. They can tackle a little bit of the thicker uh, decaying wood as well as those tiny conifer needles as well. And because this, this is a species group, there are ones that degrade spruce needles, pine needles, as well as hardwood and uh, leaf litter as well. Here's some other duff loving Mycena that I see a lot in the redwood and cedar forest. Mycena galopus will ooze a milky liquid if you cut the stipe when it's fresh. Mycena pura is super variable. This is maybe one of the hardest to site ID mushrooms um, in the cedar forest because the color changes drastically like day to day. They'll start out with this lovely lilac color with a with the yellow at the base, but as they age, they'll turn gray, they'll turn white, they'll turn pink, all manner of colors, and really the the stature and they have a scent too, but that fades as well. The stature and the general vibe is really the only way to get a feel for these. Um, and lastly, there's just an unidentified Mycena with a, a cool hairy base that I found in some reference. Um, here's a specialized juniper and cypress or cedar digesting cup fungus. This one is out in the late winter usually. Um, it's mostly found on junipers, but I see it pretty often on the cedar needles in the Northwest as well. I haven't heard of any of these being found on redwood, but this is an example of one that you in the redwoods should keep your eyes out for in the colder months, because it's very interesting to find fungi that overlap in habitat with other fungi or that follow plant families around in ways that we haven't noticed before. Here is Coloriza umbonata. This one is the opposite of that Pythia cupressina. It is a redwood obligate mushroom, at least seemingly it's a redwood obligate. It has a really long rooting stipe. I've seen one of these that was like three feet long. They come up from the deep duff and fruit their little fruit out the top. They may look like a drab boring mushroom if you don't dig all the way down, but this is an example of why you don't cut. You always want to get the, the bottom of the base out, even when you're looking for edibles, you know, because there might be a lot, a majority of that mushroom might be under the ground. But when, when it comes to identification, sometimes the base is absolutely vital and or very interesting and huge as in this species. Um, I thought that these were mycorrhizal, like a Phaeocolibia, which is another deep rooting species for a while, but it turns out that they're actually a decomposer. So they might just be preferring to live at that lower duff layer between the, the soil and the duff boundary or something like that. Um, it would be really interesting to do some sort of a mycelial DNA study and see where in the duff layer is this fungus growing because they definitely require the deep duff. 
So here is one of my favorite subjects. There is a mysterious alliance or association between four families of mushrooms. This was discovered in the 90s in the UK by some Welsh scientists, I believe. They were looking at sensitive grasslands in the area. Actually, not any kind of dark forest like you would find these fungi in here. In the UK, these four families are closely associated in these grasslands that are either grazed intermittently by animals or kept open through other means, but they don't quite correlate with vascular plant diversity um, and their ecological roles are often not quite known. Some of them are decomposers for sure, like the Claveriaceae has some decomposing members and Entelomataceae does as well. And some of them are definitely mycorrhizal or endophytic, so they live within the actual growing shoots of the plant. Um, Hygrophoraceae has some mycorrhizal and endophytic members that are for sure known. But also these families have members where we have no idea what they do in the environment. Their ecology is a complete mystery to this day. And many of them, especially the Hygrophoraceae, have been very difficult to culture in a lab um, and that sort of thing. So they're, they're quite an enigma. And they also have a lot of members that aren't well known to science. These four families were used to find sensitive grasslands, like I mentioned in the UK, in order for to uh, find which ones need to be conserved. Um, areas with high diversity of one of these families usually has high diversity of all four, even if they grow at different times of the year, and they cluster really tightly. So if you find a spot with a bunch of club fungi coming up, if you come a month or two later, you might find a bunch of antelomas or waxy caps growing in that exact same spot. And this is true all over the world. So this is true here in the tropics where I am. Um, we've been finding uh, waxy caps with antelomas and with clubs for sure. Um, this is true in the redwood and cedar forests, which are quite different from those grasslands in the UK. And it's true in Australia, in the sclerophyll forest, which is more similar to the redwood forest, but it's not dominated by conifers. It's other sorts of plants with hard leaves and that sort of thing. So it's quite an enigma, this association, and it still needs a lot of work looking into it. Here are some examples of Claveriaceae fungi. So on the top left, that's Claveria fragilis. That's a really reliable indicator of a waxy cap spot. Waxy caps are my main focus of interest um, because I find them amazingly beautiful and they're understudied as well. So if you see a lot of these uh, little mung bean sprout looking uh, clavarias that break really easily, uh, that is a almost dead on indicator of those waxy caps in the redwood environment. Below that is the Clavulinopsis leda color the crown coral. This one is more of a grassland species. Here I found it in an area where it is cedar dominated, but there is also a lawn that gets mowed underneath. So this is kind of an intermediate habitat between what you would find in the UK with the waxy cap spots and what you would find here with the waxy cap spots, but it's a man-made habitat. Um, so it's a really interesting microhabitat for a lot of fungi, and I found actually a new species of fungus in this exact same spot with the cedar lawn habitat. Top middle is a Mucronella. Redwood Coast describes this undescribed species as Mucronella yellow. Um, no genetic work has been published on these as far as I know, but I have a sneaking suspicion that they shouldn't really be included in this family in the modern sense, just because they have quite a different ecology. They grow on like vertical rotting wood surfaces, often on cut faces of logs. Um, this one here is growing on a cut log like that, but they do decay the redwood and cedar fungi or cedar wood, sorry. Um, 
And below that is another really good indicator of a wax cap spot. The Clavulinopsis Leda color, the Handsome Club. Those are almost always right next to waxy caps wherever I find them. Top right is Clavi Corona Taxophila, the U Club with the flat top, sort of a wavy margin. It looks like it almost has gills sometimes. Um, and this one is said to be associated with yew trees uh, in the genus Taxus. But in my experience, they're actually a lot more common in pure cedar stands without a U in sight. Um, we have a lot of U in my area in the Northwest, but there's also a lot of forest without any U at all. And anecdotally, they are in the forest without U a lot more than they are the forest with U. There are some sightings of them from the Redwood Forest in California, and I'd be really interested to know if those come with a yew tree nearby or without it, because, yeah, I, everything I've read about those says that they are associated only with the yew tree, but it doesn't seem to be so in my experience. And below that, there is a really interesting member of this family that actually has gills. Oops, 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 oh no. <laughs> Um, it actually has gills, so that's Hodophilus popertinus. They smell really terrible, one of the worst mushrooms I've smelled um, up there, you know, top three at least. They smell like rotting teeth or mothballs uh, is the polite European way to say it. Um, and they could, uh, develop these gills convergently with other gilled mushrooms. So from this club state, they evolved a gill state simply because that is a really good way to have a horizontal or, or yeah, a horizontal downward facing surface in order to drop their spores into the wind like a basidiomycete needs to do. And the gill shape um, really extends the surface area of that sheltered um, horizontal downward facing surface. So that's a really interesting convergent evolution form. And there's quite a few genera in the Claveriaceae that take on a gilled mushroom habit. Here's the Hygrophoraceae. These are my favorite mushrooms. I think they're the most beautiful mushrooms in the world. You can probably see why. They're often so brightly colored and slimy and they come out in the dark of the winter when, especially in Washington, people get real depressed in the dark of the winter. And just what you need is to go out into the forest and find a bright red mushroom or bright green mushroom to perk your day up. Um, a lot of them are really slimy. That seems to be some sort of an adaptation to fend off the cold. They don't freeze that easily like other mushrooms do, like chanterelles, for example, will freeze pretty much solid, whereas these can stay out in the cold and they don't ever seem to freeze. I've never seen one frozen, at least not the slimy ones. Uh, the top right one is a scarlet waxy cap, Hygrosabe coccinea, although that's a European name and not quite sure if the West Coast one belongs in that group. Below that is um, Gliophorus latus. Um, this is known as the heath wax cap because it grows in the, the heather grasslands of the tundra and also in Northern Europe a lot. So that's one that we see both in the, in the grasslands over there in Europe and also in the dark forest in North America. It seems to be the same species despite those habitats being really different from each other. So there must be some sort of a missing piece with the ecology of these fungi that allows them to live in both of these radically different habitats. Top center is the exact same deal as far as habitat goes. They live in the grasslands in Northern Europe and Siberia, and as well as these dark rainy forests in North America. This is Gliophorus latus, the parrot, the parrot mushroom. Uh, definitely one of the most photogenic mushrooms in the world. And some of the most beautiful ones you'll see are in those redwood forests. Below that is Hygrosabe miniata. This is probably the most common one on the West Coast, but it can be really hard to identify because they vary a lot in their color, their size, and their shape. The really the key to identifying this mushroom is the fact that they have little tiny, tiny scales on the cap. 
you probably can't even see it in this photo. You need a hand lens to see it in person even a lot of the time. And they're always pretty dry as far as a waxy cap goes. They don't get a lot of slime. Top left is a hygrosabi fluorescence group. This one, some DNA work has been done and it, it has been split up in the past by people based on just how it looks morphologically. I'm not sure how well those groups hold up to the DNA scrutiny. And I would think that a combination of the two should be used in some modern work in order to really sort them out. Right now, we're calling them all hygrosby fluvescens, which is the European name, but the ones on the West Coast are not actually hygrosby fluvescens, which is why we, if you ever see CF, hygrosby CF fluvescens, that means it's not that, but we're calling it that. So that's what that means if you see that. And then below there is a really rare Pacific Northwest endemic mushroom or a variety of a mushroom that is only found in the Pacific Northwest. This is another late summer, actually, you know, all through the summer, this mushroom fruits. It loves the hottest months of the year, very dry uh, air, but it grows out of swamps and bogs, usually right out of the cedar wood. So this is a good candidate for possibly being a decay fungus if any waxy caps are decay fungi, but it, the jury is still out and there are a lot of mosses around where it grows. So it could be associated with a moss or a liverwort in some way. That's Humidicutus uh, marginata var olivacea, which is kind of a mouthful, but it seems to be a variant of an East Coast mushroom that looks completely different. It's fully orange, no green at all. But if you look at the DNA, this one nests really strongly into that mushroom. So it being described as a variety is actually valid. It seems pretty spot on. Here's a mushroom that is a part of the waxy cap family. Obviously, you've probably seen this one if you've been out this fall and winter in California. It's been a really good year for them. I saw hundreds. Um, Hygrosby acuta conica. This one was thought to be not present in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it was thought that we only had the blackening uh, conic waxy caps. But I found this spot on the right here. These, this collection is from the same spot where two years ago, no, last year I found a collection and we sent it off for DNA and it matched really strongly to one of Damon Tahi's collections from Oakland. So it's now confirmed um, just from my campus, it's now been confirmed that this mushroom occurs not just in California, but also in the redwood forest. Here's another really cool range extension. This is one I'm really excited about. Um, it is an endangered mushroom. It's on the red list. It's on the fundus rare 10 list, if you all are familiar with that effort. Um, Gleophorus flavifolius. It was described as hygrosabi flavifolia, but it seems a lot more like a Gleophorus to me. So far, the DNA has been not running at all on this mushroom. This is true with a lot of Gleophorus. Um, either there's some sort of issue with the DNA primers that we're using, or the slime on them is interfering with it somehow. But we run a lot of slimy wax caps and don't have an issue with them. So that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's a rare mushroom. Uh, even in its known range, which is generally the San Francisco Bay Area, the center of uh, the sightings is right where you are in the Santa Cruz Redwoods, I assume where most of you are. But my, uh, my sighting is almost 700 miles uh, disjunct from the rest of the population and not a redwood in sight. All cedars um, from the edge of an eroding trail and right in the middle, smack dab in the middle of the most diverse uh, Chegg spot that I found. So it has all four of those families, plus a few other mushrooms that are often related or often associated with them in habitat. And it's it doesn't even seem like good quality forest if you were to look at it from a from a forester or botanist standpoint. It's really mixed forest, second growth. 
it's mostly cedars, but it's a lot of other different trees and it's all eroding too. So uh, yeah, why it's there, not, it, not known at all, but I would really hope that it gets found more in the cedar forest and that it gets considered for some sort of a conservation indicator because these spots are really unique and special and we don't know what's going on there. So until we can figure that out and how to work around it while using these areas, I think that we should uh, set them aside for some sort of scientific study. Here's another, this is actually an undescribed species. It occurs in the Redwood Coast for sure, but also up north where I live. These are all from Olympia. This is Hygrosabe fenestrata, which is a nom prov, which means it's not a official name yet, but it has been published. I actually think Christian made that name up, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's close to the European Hygrosabe glutinopes, which means glutinous foot, of course, and it also it has a very glutinous foot, but it has a few notable differences in its uh, morphology, but really the DNA is, is pretty different, even though that's the species that it's closest to. So it certainly deserves its own name. Really slimy cap, really slimy stipe, and very striate cap um, margin, as well as it has this really translucent or sometimes milky center to the cap. Um, and that is I believe the reason for the name fenestrata, meaning windowed, because it has this sort of window or skylight in the top of the cap. Here are some photos of Hygrosabe latissima. This is another range extension that was found um, by my friend Lauren on our campus in the same spot where I found that Flavifolius. Um, these two mushrooms, these two photos look quite different, but this red one actually, in terms of DNA, nests pretty strongly into Latissima. I still, I honestly, I still can't believe it. Um, but this one was thought to be a redwood endemic species, but it really does occur up the coast with the relatives of the redwood tree as well. So more overlap between the two habitats. Here's my undescribed species from the cedar lawn habitat in the center of the road in Olympia. I call it the Parkway Waxy Cap, Hygrosibe Parkwayensis, I guess. Um, yeah, it was growing in this, you can see the dandelions, you can see the weedy lawn grass, but also the, the duff. It's closest to the European Hygrosibe Constrictospora but it's certainly not that. It looks very different. The DNA is fairly different, um, but more collections need to be found and I need to do more work on the collections that I have. We should run more DNA primers and uh, that sort of thing. The spores are constricted as the constrictospora name suggests. So they look kind of like little figure eights. Um, I wish I had a photo of those, but uh, I have a hard time taking photos through my microscope as of yet. One day I'll get there. Here's the next family in Chegg. So you may have forgot we were talking about Chegg, Cliveraceae, Hygrophoraceae, and Salomataceae. Here we are. Um, these ones have probably an equal number of unknown species to the wax caps. Oops. Um, they are really cryptic often, small overlooked mushrooms, not as colorful as the waxy caps, so even easier to miss. They generally have a pink spore print. Sometimes it's more towards white or like an off-white color. And in the bottom left, you can see a spore pick from Michael, Michael Kuo. Sorry. And um, you can see that they have a lot of angles on them. They call that an angular spore shape. And that's a pretty strong synapomorphy for this family. So you might know Pluteus, the deer mushroom, that also has a pink spore print. But if you were to look at Pluteus spores, I don't believe they'd be so angular as these ones are. Um, whereas if you get something that maybe looks like an Entelometaceae, you can tell for sure based on those angular spores. 
top right or top left, sorry, is an alboleptonia. So this one, if you find a young one, you might not think it's an entoloma at all, but as it matures, the, the gills will really take on a dark pink, salmon pink color. And this has been a really good year for alboleptonia in the Pacific Northwest. I found a few in California, but I think I was there a little late in the season for them. Below that is an unknown entoloma. I wish I had collected those, but you can't collect them all, unfortunately. Top center is Rhodosibi. This is a genus that definitely needs a lot of work in the, in the West Coast in general. Uh, I don't know if we have any names that have been used for our West Coast gen or our West Coast Rhodosibi that are properly applied. All of the ones I've seen have been European names that don't seem right. Um, and so if you're looking for new species of mushrooms to study, Rhodosibi is a great candidate genus. Below that is an Entoloma medianox. This is actually an Entoloma that is popular as an edible, mainly because it's pretty chunky, but also a lot of Entoloma taceae can be toxic. So know your Entolomas before you go eating them. But these are pretty easy to ID. There's not a lot that looks like this big, chunky blue mushroom with kind of salmon pink gills in the forest. They're pretty unique. And the last, lastly, here's an unidentified leptonia. I just thought the double stipe on this blue one in the corner is pretty interesting. Puzzarella is a new species or a new genus to me as of this year. Um, this is a really rare genus. There's like, there's one on the, on the California proposed red list, I believe, but I don't know if any of these are the same. All the Puzzarellas look really similar to me. I found six or seven different spots very far away from each other in the Northwest this year. Um, and all under sheltered areas, like under a log where they were protected from the rain but during the peak of the rainy season. So fruiting out of dry soil, but during the rainy season, which is pretty interesting. They're very shaggy on top and also on the stipe, which is really unique for an Entelometaceae. That's not uh, common at all. Lastly, in terms of the Chegg groupings, we have our Geoglossaceae. Of course, this really eye-catching green one is Microglossum viridae. Unfortunately, I haven't managed to see this mushroom yet. I really am dying to. Um, they're so, so gorgeous. Unlike the rest of these families we've been talking about, these are actually ascomycete fungi, so they're related to cup fungi and morels, whereas these other mushrooms, even the clubs that look really similar to these earth tongues, the, those are actually basidiomyces, so they're not um, closely related to these ones. Uh, the top right photo is a trichoglossum hirsutum, which has really fine hairs on the head of that tongue, and that's one of the ways to tell them, but really the easiest way to tell them is with microscopic investigation because those hairs are almost microscopic themselves, quite difficult to see. If you hold a bright enough flashlight up to these ones, if they're releasing their spores, their spores are actually incredibly long. So this is a photo of their spores down here on the bottom right. They have a lot of different cells per spore, even though they're all genetically identical. That's called being a multiseptate spore. Because they're so big with a flashlight, you can actually see them shooting off of the fruit bodies sometimes, um, which is really incredible to see. Uh, with your naked eyes. Lastly, this is not included in any of those Chegg families, but it seems to occupy the those exact same spots where the Chegg grows. So the in within the redwood and the cedar forest, these Chegg groupings are really localized in certain spots, in my experience, and Pseudobeospora is almost always there with them. The only issue is that these are some of the hardest mushrooms to see. And then on top of that, to distinguish this from another mushroom like a Mycena or something else that's small and indistinct, 
can be quite difficult and takes a trained eye. But this is another genus that needs some taxonomic work. So if you're looking to contribute to science, get some of these vouchered and get them into an herbarium or send them to someone who can do DNA sequencing. Lichens are present in the redwood and cedar forests. Um, they are really strongly limited by light in these areas, not by water. So lichens are, of course, composite organisms of a fungus and an algae or a cyanobacteria. And they are photosynthetic like plants. So they are able to make their own food. They are growing on this wood and these leaves without decaying the wood or the leaves much at all. And because of this habit, they get all of their water from the air. So they're strongly limited by water and also by light. In the redwood forest, you don't see a lot of what's called corticalis lichens, not a lot of diversity at all. It's mainly mosses that grow on these redwoods and cedars, but you do see this dust lichen, um, which is called a leprous lichen or a gene in part of the genus Lepraria. Um, they're composed of just these little tiny dusty granules that's made of the fungus and the algal component, of course. And they reproduce, reproduce asexually only by creating this dust that basically just blows from tree to tree. It can paint the whole side of a tree in this seafoam green 1950s aesthetic kind of color. It often looks just like as if the tree had been spray painted a few years ago and some of it has rubbed off but it's not quite that. If you can get up and real close and investigate with your fingers, you can dust some of it off a lot more easily than you would be able to if it was spray paint. And on the left, we have some folliculus lichens. A folliculus habit growing on the living leaves of a plant is actually pretty rare in lichens outside of the tropics they require not only a lot of water in the environment to have a folliculus habit, but they also require leaves that don't uh, die a lot. And so in deciduous forests in the temperate regions, they're not gonna be able to have these like strong, stiff leaves with a thick waxy coating that allows these lichens to actually have a proper substrate to grow. The leaves are either going to be too thin or too ephemeral, or if they're pine needles, they don't provide that sort of surface area. Um, here in the tropics, they are pretty much everywhere. The leaves here are very wide and flat. They get plenty of water all year, and so lichens can grow much faster here. But lichens in general are quite slow growing, so these needles with, with all of these lichen communities on them have been on the tree for quite some time and they're in just the right place to get enough water and sunlight for these lichens to thrive. The pink cups here are Felhanera species, but if you look really closely, these uh, needles, the redwood and the cedar, both have quite a diversity of lichens in these communities. Um, including the leprous ones that grow on the bark and some of the ones that grow on branches. But some of them are obligate folliculus lichens, like this pink cupped Felhangera. Um, lastly, I just want to talk about some of the other West Coast members of the Cupersaceae because the redwoods get a lot of mycological attention just because there's a lot of people hunting mushrooms in California. The cedars, you know, they get a lot too because mushrooms are popular in the Northwest, but they don't get as much as I would like them to. But these plants really, mycologists don't really pay that much attention to them in general. So over here on the left is Calotropsis nutcatensis, the Alaska yellow cedar or the stinking cedar. They have kind of a pungent smell to the needles. I wouldn't say it stinks. That's just a common name. It's, it's, it's relatively pleasant. Um, but they have this juniper-like cone, um, not quite a cone, not quite a berry. 
and scale-like needles that are quite similar to the thruhip plicata. I suspect many mycologists that are surveying these northwestern areas with this tree are not knowing their tree ID correctly and don't know quite enough to note it down. They're also more restricted to some harder to reach areas like high in the mountains where there's a lot of snowpack and they also go all the way up the Alaska coast to like Sitka Island roundabouts. So they require a, a deep snowpack in the winter in order to have their, uh, their life cycle. And so I would think that if any of these mushrooms are present in these forests, it's going to be during the summer or maybe in the early fall and late spring. Spring snowmelt fungi are quite an interesting ecology, so I would really like to get out to some Calotropsis forest. In the center is Juniperus maritima, the maritime juniper. So this is a Washington endemic tree that was actually described really recently. I think in 2014, it was separated from the Rocky Mountain juniper, which grows mostly in the Great Basin and the Rocky Mountains, of course. The Great Basin and Rocky Mountains, you know, there's some good mushroom habitat in the Rocky Mountains, but in the Great Basin, they're pretty moisture limited. Like you don't get enough rain out there to have a good fruiting flush most of the time. Whereas here in the North Puget Sound, it's a little drier than in the Southern areas where I live, but the proximity to that coastal rainforest and the, it does get a fair amount of rain warrants these trees getting some more attention from mycologists. I really haven't known anyone who has done extensive surveys in this habitat. They get pretty ignored just like the oaks do in the Northwest by mycologists, but I would say even more so. Um, I've talked to people who live up in the Bellingham area where these grow and Nobody seems to know or care much about which fungi grow with them. So I'd be really interested to know more about that in the future. And lastly, here are some Hesperocyperus. The top photo is a Monterey Cypress, which is probably a familiar tree to you all. Um, they're endemic to a really small area in Monterey. Hesperocyperus is uh, the Western Cypress tree, of course. That this genus is really diverse in the Southwest. The pattern of having narrow endemic uh, species is pretty consistent in these. But the Monterey Cypress has been planted up and down the coast, all the way up to Washington. I see them on the seaside in Washington sometimes. Um, the Monterey Cypress, in their native habitat, in the habitat where they get planted, they receive quite a bit of rain and they have a lot of interesting mushrooms with them. A lot of those Pseudobeospora, the waxy caps, um, there's some other interesting fungi that live in their thick duff. But the other Hesperocyperus species, like this one, which is a uh, Hesperocyperus pygmaea, they don't receive quite as much mycological attention, often because of the dry limitation, similar to the way the junipers are. Um, or in the case of this pygmy cypress, they grow alongside pines and redwoods and blueberry family plants that generally have a lot more associate fungi. But this genus is also in need of more mycological attention, if you ask me. Um, yeah, and so now I will be happy to take any questions. I don't know if any have popped up in the chat. Um, Thank you for sitting through my talk. <laughs> Thank you, Luca. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, maybe we can, if you can quit sharing your screen, we can see folks' faces. Um, okay. And I can read questions from the chat or folks can unmute themselves and ask questions directly to Luca. I'm gonna look through really quickly here and see. Um, Kathy S says, what studies are you doing when you say you study them? What do you do with the sequence after you have sequenced these fungi? And I will just add a, an additional point to that question. Luca, are you doing sequencing yourself or do you like uh, do what I do and what the Federation has sponsored here where you have a club sponsoring you to send specimens to a sequ sequencing facility? Um, so I have done 
some sequencing, but mostly I have sent them off to a sequencing facility. In my last year at Evergreen, which was this year, I finished like halfway through this year, um, we did do some in-house sequencing um, or at least in-house extraction and amplification of the DNA and the actual sequencing is a much more involved process. So we created the, pro the product that then gets sent off to be sequenced. So we did like three quarters of the sequencing in-house um, during that. And what you do with the sequence after you get it is basically you run it through a database of other sequences and use that to compare what you got from your mushroom with algorithmic uh, techniques with the computer um, in order to see how closely related it is to other fungi. And yeah, I hope that's a good answer. Um, and in terms of other things that I do in terms of studying them, um documenting them is a big a big deal get on iNaturalist if you're not already um because it helps to expand the range maps as you saw and also just the understanding of things in general um more more photos more people seeing things is everything um and also I voucher mushrooms and send them to herbaria, like I mentioned early on before people joined. Um, I'm here in Trinidad right now visiting family. I'm in the Caribbean and they don't have any mushrooms in the national herbaria here. And me and my friends are going to get them started with some mushrooms um, because they didn't, the, the, Curator has some interest in fungi, but he didn't really have a protocol for storing them. Um, but it's really not difficult. I mean, they have a bunch of pressed plants, and I think that's a little bit more intensive than it is to store fungi. All you have to do is really keep them dry uh, with a little silica gel or what have you. So that is, yeah, that's... Okay, we have a, an important question here from Wendy So who says, you said yellowfoot was mycorrhizal with huckleberry. Is this something you discovered? My understanding from the literature is that huckleberries are not ectomycorrhizal. And this is actually something that I have gotten wrong a couple times before. Um, in my last conversation with David Aurora, he sort of fact-checked me on this. And when I looked at the most recent literature from um, Tater Zoo, I believe it was, this European author who sort of cataloged all the known plant families, including their subfamilies. Um, it was only the Arbutoidae uh, subfamily of Ericaceae that forms ectomycorrhizae, as far as I read it, but there's certainly, um, so, so I sort of defaulted to that understanding after, after David asked me to clarify that. Um, is there hey. more that you know about Huckleberry that we don't know? They also, they may, they also don't, they, yes, that's correct. They don't form ectomycorrhizae, which is the, the sheath wrapping around the outside of the root, but they do have ericoid mycorrhizae, which is sort of an in-between of a penetrative into the root mycorrhiza and an, uh, a sheathing one. And yellowfoot does that? I, I was under the impression that they did, but it's possible that they are uh, obligate ectomycorrhizal. Um, I'm not really sure. That's an interesting question. Okay, yeah. So I, I think that's the uh, the point that everyone wants clarification on now. I think yeah, that, I think the, that the, they the, may be more specialized ericoid mycorrhizae and not ectomycorrhizae. So I may be wrong about the yellow feet in that. Got it. Most likely. Okay. Mushman says, have you noticed a role? Oh, R-O-L-E, a role for these sort of fungi post-fire. I seem to notice a proliferation of ascomycetes. So I think maybe he's talking about the chegs there. Do you see the chegs post-fire? I don't think so at all. Um, I found in a, a very small burn site where just the undergrowth burned in Olympia, I have seen some antilomas, but I don't think they're there because of the fire. I think that they're there because the fire was a very mild fire. Um, there's definitely a lot of ascomycetes that uh, seem to come up after fires. Morels are pretty fire associated in the Northwest. 
um, there's a lot of obligate cups and, and that sort of thing that come up on the ground. Um, usually the way it goes after a fire is the first year is the ascomycete year. And the second year you start to get more of the guild mushroom uh, fire associates like the mixomphalia and that manner of thing. Uh, I think there's a uh, hand up. Oh, I'm forgetting the name. Never, never mind. Oops. Dan, were you going to say something? Oh, you? yeah. Uh, I see uh, Kathy has her hand raised. I don't know if you answered her question from the yeah, chat. So, so back to the sequencing question. So, um, so it seems like there's no real scientific question behind the sequencing. It's just like send out sequencing, send out these fungi for sequencing and try to identify if they're similar or different from another. There's no real scientific question behind these, is there? Well, that is, sorry, go, go on. No, no, that, you know, that's what I'm trying to understand. It's like. That is the scientific question. It's like whether or not we are calling this mushroom by the right name, basically. So a lot of times um, in North America and all over the world, but especially in North America because of the similarity of climate, um, people came from Europe and they started doing science on the East Coast and they noticed a lot of the fungi there look the same as the European ones. And so they started calling them by the exact same names. Um, and that kind of proliferated across the continent as colonialism spread. Um, but as the science has evolved more, we've got better microscopes, we've got these molecular techniques now we're starting to realize that these names shouldn't really apply to these fungi that are separated from those populations by hundreds or thousands of miles. Some, in some cases, they do apply and they seem to nest really well, um, but in other cases, they don't. So the scientific question in that case would be like, is this really a Hygrosibe flavescens, or is this a new species that needs to be split out of Hygrosibe flavescens due to them not actually being that closely related? So, I'm sorry to push on this. So, you know, just to be pushy at the moment. So what? So what if it's the same or different? What 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 is the the extension of that? You know, the mushrooms are different from the other organisms, right? Plants, animals, they, they pop up, they stay here for a long time. Uh, mushrooms pop up, they disappear, and sometimes they don't even reoccur in the same spot. So what are you Well, they're to still there. Like the, myce the mycelium is still there. They are part of the ecosystem. They have functions in the ecosystem. So like their existence does matter. Yeah, sorry to put you on the spot. I guess it's to uh, okay. the, the whole federation, I guess, right? Because they're paying for this. So there, there should probably be a more deeper scientific question around just, you know. Who I actually are. pretty strongly disagree with that. Um, the federation has funded our uh, biodiversity documentation here entirely without a hypothesis driven nature, which is what is absolutely required for any sort of deep understanding of the natural history of an area long before you can begin to form a hypothesis or observe interesting natural history interactions um, you need to know the characters and we don't know that so we're starting from square one you could argue we're starting from square zero and um, I, I really want to continue to advocate for the fact that basic natural history knowledge is valuable regardless of whether or not it ever results in um, sexier modern hyper trendy uh, academic research. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend or put you guys on the spot. I didn't mean not to fund it. I'm just saying that there are questions that can be asked probably yeah, a little I, more than just who are you, right? Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. that uh, and I don't think anyone's offended at all because these are good questions. Uh, but if you're going to discuss something, you have to sort of know the name of what you're discussing. So if you don't know the species and one person starts making a lot of observations and, you know, it's sort of like if somebody says, well, the big white mushrooms here are edible. And then somebody in another country eats the big white mushrooms, but it turns out they're not the same big white mushrooms. So that's why 
it's important to uh, uh, have a, uh, an understanding of what species you're really dealing with. So, yeah, and the same can be said for uh, their role in the ecosystem. So yeah. if we care about like preserving nature and biodiversity in general, it's important to take scope of what the biodiversity actually is that exists instead of just assuming that we already know based on the concepts that were come up with hundreds of years ago. So you guys must be having already several hundred sequences, right? For different are, are you talking to Luca? Not me it personally. It doesn't matter, Every, you know, whoever's doing the sequencing. So there's- I mean, Well, there there's there's globally, there's, there's millions, millions of sequences globally, yeah. Okay, so there's, you know, there's already questions that could be asked, like, is the simple question, can you eat it, right? So is there something? Um, a sequence can't tell us that. No, but you can find similarities if you know which mushrooms you have, and you know that those those with certain, certain ones with certain names are edible, certain are not, then you can try millions of sequences is a lot of data. And you can start asking interesting questions. And I think we're going to. I think that's a, de definitely something that, that people are going to use uh, these sequences to do. Building a phylogeny can give you hints about edibility. And um, definitely people have worked backwards from our understanding of what mushrooms are related to one another to get that. But it's certainly not, I don't think, the first question people are asking. Well, I'm just today. saying, you know. And also millions of sequences are actually not a huge amount of data when compared to like the actual biodiversity that exists on the planet, um, especially because most of these sequences aren't full genome sequences. So they're just small snippets of the DNA that we use to compare different things to each other. Um, more of those from different regions are needed in as well as macroscopic and microscopic morphological work in order to see like what is really the character of a mushroom. You can't determine everything just based on snippets of DNA, but yeah. they are helpful data points and like generating more of that data is absolutely useful for answering all sorts of questions. And just to cut off this question, uh, so Kathy, come back for Danny Miller's talk on DNA sequencing and you can ask him a little more about it. Uh, we have a few. Right, I think that's tomorrow. Yeah, well, tomorrow. Yes, we have a few lighter questions from the YouTube channel. Uh, the Nature Kid wants to know if any of those waxy caps of mycenas and redwood rooters are edible. Uh, Some of the waxy caps are edible. I know that people in Europe eat them sometimes, but um, they are not really common. And then also, like the texture, like. Okay, I'm a pretty adventurous eater, but the texture of a lot of those waxy caps, just on touching them and looking at them would be enough to put me off. <laughs> um, people, yeah, people do eat them sometimes, but um, I haven't. I usually find, I usually find better edibles while I'm out in the forest down on the ground looking for tiny things, I'll like yeah. stumble across a, a nice porcini or some chanterelles and some stuff like that. And I'd rather eat the, the things that I know are like really delicious yeah. myself. Okay. Yeah, actually I, I have kind of a broad, broad question. Uh, since uh, the main thing I, saw in this talk was just the striking similarity. Uh, you know, you described a lot of species that we're very familiar with that are very common in our redwood forests that you see up with the red cedars. Uh, and what I'm wondering is, do you know um, which forest, you know, is older from an evolutionary standpoint? And do you think that these mushrooms mostly co-evolved with one forest and moved to the other? Or do you think some evolved in one group of trees and some with the other, and then they just liked what they That's saw a next door? Really good question. I think I, I'm not entirely sure, um, but I do know that the fossil record for redwood trees in the genus Sequoia mm -hmm. goes back all the way to the Eocene. Um, so right after the KT extinction uh, mm -hmm. event where the dinosaurs were killed off. 
I don't know when Thuha came about, um, but I would imagine that a lot of these mushrooms were co-evolving with the sequoias. Um, they used to have a much more extensive range. You can see yeah. sequoia and metasequoia fossils in, in central Nevada and Arizona um, from back when the climate was much different. Um, so my guess would be that the sequoia is evolutionarily older. Okay. Oh, and there's a cool question from Hart Singer. Um, what plant species do you find Puzzarella growing there? Mm, um, yeah. Big leaf maple, Acer macrophyllum, uh, is a tree that is usually there. Also those sword ferns, the polystichums. Um, but really the main thing that I saw, so I only saw them this year, but I saw quite a lot of them. The main consistent thing that I saw was that they're in a dry patch of dirt surrounded by wet dirt. That, that is super interesting. And I'll, I'll just note briefly that there's only two records of Puzzarella from Santa Cruz County that I know of, both of which had big leaf maple present. Mm. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Art Singer mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, any other questions? Folks can unmute themselves or you can type your chat uh, question into the chat and I can read it. Okay, well, it's closing in on nine and I just wanna give Luca another big thanks, not only for being here, but for being here a couple hours ahead in, in your time. Um, Oh yeah, it's uh, almost I, one in the morning here. <laughs> I hope you sleep well tonight and we look forward to someday seeing you in person at an event in Santa Cruz. Oh, I right. would love to come to an event in Santa Cruz. Yeah. Nicely yeah. done, Luca. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, y'all. Cheers, Thank everybody. You. Thank you, Luca. Right. See, you, see you tomorrow night for Danny Miller and DNA, uh, the biggest revolution in mycology since the microscope. Great job, Luca. Thank you. Hey. Hey, Thank you, Don, Dan, for putting me on the uh, list. Oh, there. Lee. Yeah, yeah I, saw, I saw you there somewhere. <laughs> All right. Bye now. <laughs> hey, bye, Lee. I think Bill Hunter fell asleep. Oh, no, he's, he's moving.